Just to um, reiterate my thanks to Prero for inviting me to be part of this um, very, very interesting day for me. Um, I um, am not a specialist at all in Elizabeth Frink. Um, it gave me a wonderful excuse to get to know her work better, um, and I'm learning um, a great deal. Prero asked me to talk about bronze as a sort of a material from a kind of a, my uh, understanding um, uh, as a Renaissance um, expert, and in a way giving a bit of a sort of historical context about it. Um, so um, I hope that you will find this um, not uninteresting, particularly thinking about Calvin's talk and um, perhaps some sort of influences and how Frink was obviously a very, very um, radical artist in not necessarily using new materials, but I think using them in a new way um, and aware of the past traditions, doing some very, very interesting and actually perhaps more interesting than people have previously thought things with bronze. So just some very, very basic information, because um, if you don't really understand the matter of bronze, then you don't really understand Frink or anybody else who's worked in it. So it's a man-made alloy um, composed of copper and tin, which have to be basically dug up, mined from the earth, refined, and then uh, um, melted together to form, to create an alloy, which has got this rather beautiful dull gold colour. Now, the proportions to make bronze can vary. The primary component is copper, anywhere between about 85 and 95 percent, and the next uh, most important component ingredient is tin, and again it varies, but you can see how much uh, more copper there is uh, than tin in the mixture, and this is why you get that lovely kind of uh, yellow colour to it. Often, from the Renaissance onwards, you would deliberately add other uh, elements to it uh, to, to um, change the characteristics of the bronze, uh, or change the colour, or change its ductility, or um, how it performed around the mould as a liquid metal. So you might either deliberately, or perhaps inadvertently, if you are recycling old broken bells, old cannon, you might inadvertently end up introducing other elements into the alloy, silver, zinc, arsenic, and so on. Um, and all of these different elements add together to make each alloy you create, in a way, is unique and has unique characteristics and properties. Um, and these different types of alloy would have generally different components in them, depending if you absolutely intended to make a bell, you would have a higher tin content in it, because tin is what gives the sonorous aspect to bells, but actually it makes also the metal a little bit brittle. So, for example, for gun metal, you deliberately avoid less tin in the mixture, because otherwise the guns would end up exploding on the battlefield. Um, Bronze, um, in the history of art, is a very uh, sort of traditional material. It's often thought to be rather sort of academic. Um, I think another thing that is important to understand is that in order to create or end up with something in bronze, you need to create a model first, and it's a very long, complicated process. If you are to create uh, a bronze directly from your model, it has to be in wax. So you as the sculptor are actually modeling. It's a malleable process in the first instance. And then you mold that wax, you melt it out, you replace it with molten bronze, it solidifies, you break open your mold, and you've lost your original wax in that process. If you cast indirectly, and Andrew may say a little bit more about this later, I'm not sure, but um, your original model can be in anything you want. It can be in wood or stone, wax, clay, plaster, and then you take moulds from that. Uh, you make an interim casting model in wax. You invest that, you melt it out, you pour in the bronze, and then you get your product. So uh, if you, it, it, the whole process of getting to the final bronze involves other materials as well. One thing I do want to mention here, thinking about a very famous ancient Roman bronze, is that often people misunderstand how these ancient bronzes were made. This is true of the Renaissance, and I think probably true of a lot of people in the 20th century, uh, that there was a misunderstanding that they were all cast in one piece, the rider and the horse. This is not true at all. They were cast in smaller sections, and then they were welded together. I'm going to come back to that later on. 
One of the benefits of the indirect lost wax casting method is that it permits a replication of your original model because when you make the interim wax casting models, you can slightly alter them before you invest them. Now, this is, of course, has got great commercial benefit to artists, and this is why it was developed originally in the Renaissance. For example, you've got two little statuettes of the famous uh, horses of San Marco. In fact, bronzes that Liz Frink uh, saw originally as an art student was very impressed by them. Um, the one in the Fitzwilliam has silvered eyes, um, in a, deemed to be slightly finer than the version in the the Bowdoin Museum, you can see how the right hoof and the tail has been slightly altered between the two, so they are variants on a theme. Traditionally, bronze sculpture, how well and whose work she admired very much, um, were criticised by the uh, artist, artistic establishment having this mud pie effect, when actually the surface was very much rougher. But the traditional, um, one of the things which uh, collectors, as much as sculptors, liked about bronze as a material was this lucid, reflective, very sensuous quality you get. Another thing just to point out is that um, you can get different qualities um, um, in, in, in terms of colour. I say that um, bronze, when it comes out of the mould, is this sort of dull um, gold colour because of the component metals, uh, but you can change the colour um, either by the um, tin or the, the other elements you add into it. You can also um, add a chemical uh, layer on the surface, a patina, uh, this patination was something that, for example, uh, Frink was very personally involved with. She liked to think about different colours for different versions of her sculptures, and also metal inlays. And this is a very um, interesting um, uh, Greek sculptor, sculpture of, of a boxer. And you can see how the lips perhaps have been coloured red, the cheeks are a slightly different colour. Again, don't think of bronze as being black and boring. Um, they're often um, very subtly coloured. Now, there are certain physical characteristics of bronze that have made it prized since antiquity um, by both sculptors and by patrons. Um, so uh, it's got say, these certain technical advantages. The main thing is that it's got what we call in the trade inherent tensile strength. It's to do with how you actually fuse bronze together. If you look at a piece of bronze under a microscope, it's got a complex crystalline structure. The crystals are not neatly aligned, which means if you whack it, it doesn't fracture. This is less true of things like marble or limestone, where the crystals are more neatly arranged, so if you hit it, it will fracture. And this is why when you, build, when you, when you excavate a, a, an ancient Roman sculpture, it's often, you know, the arms have been broken off or whatever, they're fragmentary, because it is a generally, it's a weaker material, whereas bronze has this strength. Um, and this allows the sculptor to portray these completely crazy compositions. On your left, you've got a version of Jambalonia's Flying Mercury, um, a composition that um, uh, Frank knew well. Uh, and on the right, this wonderful pre so early French Renaissance acrobat. And these running, flying, falling figures, I think, are the sort of diet which uh, Frank would have been um, aware of either consciously or subconsciously. <clears throat> Because of the inherent tensile strength, uh, it is the um, ideal material to make multifigural groups that have um, a great weight to them, better than things like marble, where you have to have unsightly struts to support the weight. Um, another useful thing about bronze is the fact that it's re resistant to corrosion, which means it can withstand the elements, and it makes it the perfect outdoor uh, material. Um, wood would obviously rot, stucco plaster inappropriate, marble yes, but it will eventually um, wear away, whereas bronze is resilient, it's resistant, it's impervious to water and so on. And because we know that Frink was very, very keen on um, placing, citing her sculpture out of doors, I think this is another reason why bronze appealed uh, to her. And as an example of um, something which is the ideal archetype of um, a public monument, uh, the Colleoni in Venice, uh, again, when Frink 
uh, visited um, uh, as, uh, uh, fairly early on in her career, December 1946. Her father was stationed to Trieste, northeast Italy. Um, he was uh, put in charge of the 4th Hussars. It's a cavalry regiment, so I think horses and men in armour. So her mother takes her for a Christmas present to Venice, and she actually mentions seeing the Colleoni along with the four horses of San Marco, these great bronze, over-life-size animals, great weight, supported on these tiny points, because this is the benefit of bronze. Other things she would have probably seen in Venice, we know she visited the Doge's Palace, these huge, great wellheads. Again, they were made in bronze because it's impervious to water and liquid. She went in many churches. She must have gone to see Titian's Assumption in the Frari. This is a beautiful Renaissance figure of St Agnes on a wellhead when you walk in. And again, I think she would have been aware um, of these um, characteristics. Bronze is a poor conductor of heat, so in the Renaissance period, as well as in ancient Roman times, it was used for functional objects, lamps, candlesticks, fire dogs. In an ecclesiastical context, it should have known well thuribles, that sort of thing. So um, these sorts of objects, I think, would have been very much in her, in her mindset. Um, it's very hard and durable as a material. Um, and again, thinking of her army background, uh, when she went to Venice, she would have seen all these bronze cannons. In fact, these are captured enemy cannon um, now outside the military museum in Istanbul. But there's a, a military museum in Venice full of bronze cannon. And again, I think that sort of military aspect of bronze, its strength, its permanence, is something that I think even at a subconscious level she would have been aware of. Again, um, you can strike it, you can bash it, it's not going to fracture. You use it for door knockers, you use it for bells, um, pounding implements like mortars. So as a result of these physical characteristics, um, bronze, really from the ancient world, um, has a reputation for being everlasting. So during the Renaissance, when people would dig up their backyards and excavate, as I say, the one object that would come out completely intact and integral, which had withstood the passage of time, were bronzes. The marbles were broken, the wall paintings one would read about in ancient texts, all gone. But the bronzes looked almost as good as the day that they had been made 2,000 years before. Statues, you've got the famous spinario, um, wonderful head. This is a um, Ptolemy head, ancient coins, so on. So this very... Um, uh, fundamental thought about bronze um, being associated with longevity, um, eternity, and therefore um, aspects of commemoration, I think, again, were important to her. There's a nice quote, these two wonderful bronzes by a uh, Baroque sculptor, Massimiliano Soldani Bensi. Um, sculptors were aware of this. He says, Le cose di bronzo sono eterne. So things from bronze are eternal. It's that long aspect. Um, in addition to the physicality, the physical, technical aspects of bronze, it's got certain aesthetic qualities which have made it beloved by sculptors and patrons over the uh, centuries. So it does have this particularly warm tonality to it, unlike marble um, or, or, or limestone or something like that. And we've talked about the reflective surfaces. The other thing is it's a very, very tactile, sensual material. If you pick up bronze and you hold a small statuette, it warms up, it's responding to you. So you've got a visual uh, aspect to it and a very keen tactile aspect, I think more than any other sculptural material. This is why the first century AD Roman historian Pliny the Elder, I think, defined bronze as the most humanising of the arts. And this is something that I think many, many sculptors have appreciated through the generations. Now, the problem with bronze, in a sense, is that it requires enormous skill and experience, and Andrew will be talking to this very much, to achieve a successful outcome. Um, during the Renaissance period, as indeed from um, ancient history, the process was not really very well understood. Um, it was shrouded in mystery. Um, often um, it was done at certain phases of the moon. Women were banished from the foundries um, in case they ex exercised some sort of malevolent influence. Prayers were said to God, where he likens himself to God, in effect, this miraculous um, 
creative power he has to transmute, transform, change materials. One material gets changed for another, and a completely new material is made. So I think this aspect is something which is also very, very uh, important to remember. Another aspect of bronze, which is either an advantage or a disadvantage, depending on your viewpoint, is the expense of the material. It's because um, there are relatively few, as it were, sources um, uh, for copper and tin. The Italians, for example, Italy is very weak in naturally occurring tin and copper, so they had to, during the Renaissance, import it in. C uh, tin for the Brits, um, copper from um, the Holy Roman Empire. If you're at war with them, um, the supplies cease. It's all rather problematic. Then you've got to uh, refine these materials, you've got to take them to the foundry, and you've got to go through this multi-stage process. Um, so really, in effect, it becomes um, a material of the um, elite. Only the most wealthy can afford it. So it becomes a status symbol. Uh, and it also gets bound up with notions of magnanimity, largesse, uh, virtuous behaviour towards your city-state. If you want to somehow ennoble it uh, as a patron, you will choose the most expensive material, the most long-lasting material, to erect a sculpture, uh, a statue commemorating somebody. And you do this as a pious thing um, to honour your city. So bronze is versatile and bronze is problematic. And I think because of this range of meanings and physical and aesthetic characteristics, the skill, the expense, um, the alchemical aspects, um, is revered from the ancient world, is revered via the Renaissance all the way through, right down through the 19th and into the early 20th centuries. It's considered a very noble material, and you get things like the Boudicca, Bodicea, uh, you know, uh, all these 19th century memorials being um, uh, put up in this, uh, uh, in this material. So all these symbolic connotations, divinity, kin kinship, um, triumph. Um, so some sculptors really understood these multiple aspects and embraced it and used bronze precisely because of this, and others reacted and rejected it because of those. There are certain other obvious problems with bronze. Um, namely, unlike any other sculptural material, it can actually be melted down and recycled. Um, so it has an inherent vulnerability, which uh, I think, again, Frink may have been aware of, and some of these uh, more vulnerable figures, the fact that they are in this supposedly permanent material that actually is not permanent at all, I think that's very interesting indeed. And these are some fragments, the surviving fragments of a colossal... Um, bronze equestrian monument uh, to uh, the French king Henry IV that was melted down in the French Revolution and this is all that remains. And it's perfectly possible that Frink could have seen this when she went to Paris, uh, um, you know, and just thought about those um, aspects of it. And again, thinking about sort of problematics of bronze, some people feel it's too ostentatious and showy. The church, for example, in the Renaissance period, often avoided bronze because, um, not necessarily the expense, but because it was considered um, inappropriate to show uh, Christ. Uh, maybe more humble materials like wood would have been better. Uh, again, the expense. But there are lots of other, I think, really interesting reasons why certain sculptors kind of avoided uh, bronze as a, as, a, as a material. And I've been thinking quite a lot about Dugger because the Fitzwilliam, as you may know, has just um, shut um, an exhibition celebrating the centenary of his death. Now, Edgar Degas, um, whose work Frink uh, admired very much, only ever worked in clay, wax and plaster scene and a little bit of plaster. Bronze, for his gravity-defying dancers and his little prancing horses, would, of course, be the most logical material to use because of the inherent tensile strength and so on. But he absolutely avoided it, like the plague, during his life. And it's very important to remember, when you look at bronzes by... Uh, 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 br bronze casts of Degas' work, they're all posthumous. None of them were authorised by him. And um, I think it's absolutely evident that he had an antipathy towards the material. Why? Well, I think for some artists, uh, there was a psychological resistance to, um, to casting um, because it severs the absolute creative link between the work and the artist. If you carve marble, 
you are absolutely capable as an artist of doing the whole thing yourself. If, unlike Hand Their Babies, over to professionals, and it's quite a brutal process, especially if you're using the direct process, because your wax model, your baby, is sacrificed in the casting process, and you hope and pray that the bronze will, uh, casting will be successful and your original is transmuted into a bronze version of it. If not, the whole thing is lost. So I think this notion of... Um, having to rely on other people is something that, in Degas' example, he really didn't want. He knew the Ebra foundry, where posthumously his, bronze, his, his works were cast or translated into bronze, but, but he, did, he never used them. And I think this mechanised process, using multiple people often, was something that Degas, for example, really objected to. In the later 19th and early 20th century, which is the kind of background to Frank, um, there was a sort of greater use of um, almost sort of, say, semi-industrialised aspects to the casting. Um, again, it became sort of dehumanised, and I think certain artists uh, were rather wary of that process. Um, they also, I think some of them, Degas certainly, uh, objected to the kind of commercialism of serial casting. Uh, he had a number of works with uh, plaster moulds taken of them, and only one version of those was produced in plaster. Okay, so he understood the casting process, uh, sorry, taking moulding process in order to reproduce, and he had one version of about three works cast in plaster. Plaster, okay. So I think this is another thing to bear in mind. And also this whole... We've been speaking a little bit about sort of um, problematics with Frink's work and other work, uh, or, or, or her contemporaries, um, people wanting to have access to these works and creating unauthorised copies, or fakes, as you would call them, which were a deterrent. But I think, ultimately, when we think about Duggar, his real objection to having his, cast, uh, his sculptures cast into bronze was that it gave them a permanence he really did not want them to have. Um, and there's a nice translation um, from a quote he said in French that um, to have uh, anything cast, it was a tremendous responsibility to leave anything behind in bronze, the medium is for eternity, or the same quotation slightly in an alternative translation, to be survived by sculpture in bronze, what a responsibility. Bronze is so very indestructible. And I think the problem with bronze for some people was that it put a greater psychological pressure on them to perfect what they were doing because of this uh, uh, eternal aspect to them. Um, and I think for Degas, he used modelling materials like plasticine, plasticine um, and clay and wax because they had embodied within them the permanent possibility for change. They were works in progress, even if that's actually not true because they would eventually fall apart, which is what happened to a lot. Now, some of the artists uh, who were very um, influential um, for Frink when she was um, um, a student in, in her formative years absolutely approved of bronze. Henry Moore, yes, of course, he carved in, in wood and marble, but he, he, he very much liked and engaged with bronze. Um, and this is a very early work. Well, the, the wax is original, uh, 1939. It's actually cast 20 years later, 1959. But um, I think Moore had quite a, yeah, a sort of um, pragmatic as well as an aesthetic understanding and appreciation of bronze. So this is a nice quote uh, from 1960. Um, he was talking about why he used wax. Um, he said that working direct wax has many possibilities. Wax has a toughness about it that will allow you to do th very thin forms, um, which you couldn't do in clay or plaster. Um, and you're able to make the forms much thinner, and the man-made uh, sort of hand-built foundry that um, uh, um, Alan Ingham, one of his uh, uh, students, made in the garden um, at Moore Studio. Um, but I think for a lot of the younger generation, um, they had a problem with bronze because they felt it was too traditional and it was too bound up with the portrayal of the figure. When you're moving into abstract work, um, or conceptual work, um, they couldn't somehow disassociate bronze with those things. And it became very 
um, emblematic of the status quo and the artistic establishment. And they were very, very keen, despite the experiments that, Bron uh, that Moore was doing with bronze, to do something completely different. So Caro left Moore's studio, 1959, goes off to New York, um, and he uh, meets David Smith, who's using steel, um, um, a very sort of modern material, and he, you know, he, he meets Clement Greenberg. He says, if you want to change your art, change your materials. And this is why, for example, in the um, 50s and 60s, he starts welding sheet metal together to create these very, very abstract, non figurative forms. But I say I'm just going to go back to the point that actually welding is a very, very ancient technique. So sometimes I think one forgets that um, sometimes um, what one thinks to be very, very modern is actually um, not quite as modern as one thinks. Now, Frink um, had certain views on bronze. This is um, absolutely a direct quotation from an interview she gave with Sarah Kent in 1985. Um, you know, somebody asked her, why did she use bronze? People wanted nothing more to do with bronze and all that old stuff, she said, but I can't see what else I would cast my sculptures in because it's a really living metal, it's beautiful, shows the light cha and changes the form. So I'm not interested in the fact that it's been used for thousands of years. And I use bronze for the very good reason that it suits what I do. And I think what's interesting is she didn't... Andrew may say a little bit more about this, her working methods, but uh, she would use often professionals to create... Uh, an internal iron armature around which to use chicken wire to create the form. Wet plaster is applied to the outside and a hessian layer is wrapped around it in, while the plaster is still damp. And you carry on doing this and you build up the shape. You feel it with your hands as you do this. So it's kind of modelling. But as the plaster hardens, she would then get knives out and spatulas and actually carve into it. So it's modelling and it's... Um, uh, carving at the same time. And then we know very much that she used professional foundrymen, Andrew will say more about that in a minute, to undertake her casting. But then she would come in once the bronze came out of the foundry and she would be very much responsible for the finishing up and also the application of the patination. And there's just a couple of slides of... Um, um, teachers or artistic associates who were using plaster in this rather unconventional way. So just to try to wrap up fairly quickly, um, I think what's interesting for me, um, knowing the work of a lot of sculptors, that she has this almost sort of obsessive, exclusive relationship with bronze as a, as a sculptural material. She doesn't move off into you know, marble or wood or whatever. Um, so we've seen in her own words various reasons that she comes up with for using bronze. But um, I do think that whether it's subconscious or conscious, there were a number of other reasons that she liked this working in plaster, very spontaneous, very quick, and her actual involvement was less long, perhaps, than had she been carving in a harder material like marble or stone. You've got the inherent tensile strength, which allows her to do these very, very long commemorations right the way through the Renaissance was, again, I think, something that she appreciated. And also, of course, the fact that um, you could, you know, via moulds, it was a reproducible material. Now, just um, moving back from Calvin's talk about influences, I just... Again, when, when I was getting to know and love Frink's work, there were just certain pieces that immediately just had a kind of a rang a, a bell in my mind. And I just thought it's very interesting just to think a little bit about um, Frink's work with a very long view. So I'm just going to run through this sequence of um, slides just in case they sort of uh, make any resonances with uh, any of you as well. Um, this is a rather wonderful mannerist bird. I, I really just immediately thought of this with some of these wonderful bird figures. Or the running men reminded me of these um, um, Roman... Um, um, statues from Herculaneum. You know, there's wonderful, wonderful seated figures. But you know, she's absolutely looking back and then reinventing, reinterpreting, and creating something completely new with completely different messages, which I find absolutely brilliant. We've talked about these Riace um, warriors, um, again, a slightly different configuration. And then um, a final thing to leave you with, um, I think this may be rather unknown or forgotten within the, the Frink oeuvre, 
uh, which is why I asked Calvin about the portrait. This has literally just been acquired by the Fitzwilliam Museum. We haven't even added a, an accession number to it yet. Um, it's a portrait of uh, Nigel Cameron, um, who died recently in Hong Kong, and he very generously bequeathed this bust of himself. And I just thought it's just rather interesting just about um, the relationship of the sitter to the artist. So he was 33 years old when he commissioned this bust from Frink, um, and it was made in 19 one and a half hour sittings. Um, thinking about how hard she worked, you can see this. Um, she's teaching at the same time, but these dates in January, February, and uh, March of 1953. Um, it was shipped over to Hong Kong, and then later in life, he actually brought the plaster bust back and had Liz um, create a version in um, bronze for him. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to um, Andrew. <laughs> 